All right, let's talk about some mistakes I see at training and kind of how to get the most out of training as well as some thoughts. Uh, so first off, I want to touch on how you show up to training because universally, almost every top arm wrestler will tell you that training with a group, human beings on a table, it, it's a part that you can't miss. You can't skip it. You can, you can mimic, micro mimic your moves in a gym once you understand the movements and tighten up those strengths and angles. I'm all for that. But kind of dissecting it is uh, you don't learn how your body wants to move until you're on a table and you build that conditioning in those lanes all as one cohesive unit. So showing up to practice, um, you'll see a lot of times guys will you know, have practiced two days before they showed up to a practice and their shoulders banged up and their elbows banged up. Or you'll see a guy who will show up and he, he just did a ridiculous arm and wrist workout and he's all wonked out. See, we're in a country where we believe that more is more. And through the years, I've come to the conclusion that that's not necessarily true for me. Because I've created my own hurdles and pitfalls because I followed that more is more thing. And what happens is when I show up to practice, zonked out, you know, wrist, wrist is torched, arms torched, all the things that I do that I would, how I'd want to set up and pull if I was pulling a John Brzenk. You know, you want everything to be on point and tight and you want to work those angles to make it crisp. You're, it's just like hitting a bucket of balls in golf. You know, you're just trying to perfect your swing, trying to perfect the contact, all your little body language, your body mechanics, all the little things that make a difference of like topping the ball and it going nowhere or crushing it straight for, you know, 300 yards. I believe that arm wrestling is very similar to that because if you showed up to practice healed and you're, you're kind of pulling, you can kind of feel where your discomfort is, kind of feel where your vulnerabilities are, what you want to tighten up, as well as you're pulling right. You're, 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 you're teaching your body to move the proper way. And if you show up all zonked out and you got a guy flopping your wrist or throwing you in a hook and opening you right up, you don't know if it's because that's a weakness or because you showed up pre-broken down and pre-fatigued. And also, you'll start teaching yourself different mechanics because instead of the, the, the way the, that your body would want to move, if you're all junked out and you got to compensate, you know, the nature of like the f fight or flight, if you get in the fight and you just want to kind of grind, but now you may be grinding out here a little bit, you may be turning away from your arm a little bit, you may be doing things that you wouldn't normally do because you're trying to compensate for those weaknesses, but those weaknesses are there because you put them there. And, you know, when you compensate, it's, uh, I, I think you start teaching your body lanes other than like dialing in on the proper ones. So I try to at least give it two days before I go to a training session before I do anything. So if I train on Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, I don't really do anything. And then I'll pack in behind Wednesday with my other stuff, you know, whatever that may be. But I think showing to a practice banged out is bad because I do think it teaches you repetition and, and uh, body mechanics the wrong way. And you can't really get a good diagnosis of where you are if it's that person was taking your hand or is it because you did three hours of hand work the day before. So, you know, you gotta kind of weigh out the, everyone's different. But I know that that was a problem for me. Also, is you got to take time to be selfish and, and work your lane. So when I looked back at the Gary Roberts Arm TV video he put up of ROTN, and I watched me pulling John Brzezik of Ron Bath, I couldn't help but think. I was like, what a horrible lane. What a horrible direction I was going. And in those times, I was incredibly strong. But the problem is, is at practice, and this is probably fall, a lot of people that are their strongest person in the practice group fall into this lane. At practice, people were getting very frustrated with my top role I was developing. It was super dominant, super strong, and they almost didn't want to practice with me. And I wasn't throttling guys, but I would just, you know, casually just kind of work their hand and take their hand. And they didn't like the way that felt, so they'd kind of train with other guys in the group. So I got to a point where I was kind of like, all right, so I would just kind of like snatch guys up and go like this. Snatch them up, go like this. Now you add that to hours a week, 52 weeks a year, you know, put some time behind that. You've done 
tens of thousands of times of when you're lining up with someone going, scoop. And that's all good until you get to your goal, which is I want to be on the big stage pulling the biggest names in the sport. And then you're going like this, scoop. And I mean, not even an aggressive, like hard, you know, shooting type, just kind of like, because when you're stressed out, I think what you train your body to do falls to default, it falls to a default setting. And it's gonna be the thing that you've trained it to do 10,000 times. And you know, you go give the hit, the initiation, the top hand, the roll in everything to a guy like Ron Bath or John Brzezink. It doesn't matter if you're a lot stronger than them. You're giving them all that mechanical advantage, you know, if John Brzezink pulled John Brzezink under those circumstances, it would look super, super lopsided when in reality was it's, you know, pretty much even. So you got to take time in your practice to find time for yourself and work, but also you've got to be able to work your angles. And that doesn't mean dusting everybody in the room, but you do have to find a way, whether it's handicapping, getting ganged up on a little bit, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of creative ways to kind of even the field, but you've got to make your mechanics comfortable in the good way not the way that's not conducive for where you're trying to end up you know uh, i'm all about building a defensive strength great but when you, that becomes 95 percent of your practice as opposed to working the things that help you want to line up or you know i've always been told if you want to be better with straps you got to actually take time and pull the straps you know you can't just go oh pull back here you got to know what you're feeling and you got to be comfortable in them and uh that's the same as any other spot on the table. If you're not training those spots, it's unfamiliar terrain for your body or it's not as comfortable as the bad stuff you might be doing. And then, you know, the, with training, that also goes to the bust of throttle city. That's what I call it. So the bust of throttle city is what I see so many people doing. They show up to practice and they just, they're in like one of two lanes. They just want to hammer or they're the guy getting hammered. And sometimes I see guys getting waxed all day like, oh, do that again, do that again. How is that helping him and how is it helping the guy that's waxing? So it doesn't matter if you're the driver on the bus or the passenger on the bus. I think going to practice with the sole point of pinning and not really working or exercising. I mean, it's it's no different than when you see guys doing, uh, you'll see purists shit on kipping pull-ups or guys who do uh, power cleans and call them curls or, you know, however many ex exercises you can just destroy with a bad form that you know it's kind of veering off of what you're actually trying to accomplish here so i think that that's what practice is when people are just hammering each other just for the sake of hammering hey you want to do that for the first 5 10 15 minutes kind of set a level of where you are in the pecking order and see where you're at and have some fun or once you're warmed up you kind of want to just turn in and grind and go shoot for the pins you train that uh finishing component or defensive comp that's all right but you've got to get a bulk of your practice in there working and working right so you're not killing each other how i mean how are you going to help the guy strengthen his hand and wrist if every time you grab him you're just cracking him cracking him cracking him that doesn't help him you know you gotta be a little more mindful with yourself and with the other people so these are just things that i see common mistakes especially the working out before going to a training session and uh especially when i look at my own history the the how i make, created pitfalls for myself by training a position you really don't ever want to find yourself in with the guys I was pulling and uh, so it's just proper habits and you know again everyone's different but the whole less is more more is more type debate what they say you know the top uh, coaches it's not practice is perfect it's perfect practice is perfect so you know you can basically take that into every day you step to a gym or workout when I grab a handle and I don't do my routine in a year doesn't look like what some of these guys do in a week or two. But when I do do something, I do it. And I'm very mindful of how and why and what it feels like. And I try to mimic grabbing someone's hand. I try to mimic the pressure feels from a direction. I don't get too focused on the weight. I'll focus on the weight once I know I'm doing it perfect. That emulates, which for me, when, I, when my gym numbers go up, my game goes up. Because sometimes I'll just close my eyes if I'm grabbing somebody really backing up at me and I'll just feel like I'm grabbing my McWoody or my new handle or whichever handle of the choice is that I just want to just clamp and contain. 
And it's really as simple as that. Like if you could just, you don't lie to yourself, you know, you grab with a straight wrist. And that's another thing about practice. Don't lie to yourself. You, you're going to pull with guys in practice that are going to make you feel like shit because they're taking everything. They're bowing their wrist. They're kind of hitting you and your hands closing. There's two ways around that. You got to either like avoid pulling with them, talk to them and tell them, say, hey, chill the fuck out. Or take it on the chin a little bit and, and, and let them run with it. But you've got to, you're not doing yourself any services by equally cheating. Because again, those body lines, that grip you're getting, starting with your wrist boat, it builds a comfort with all those things that you, we've seen some fucking ref fumbles, but you're probably not going to get it. And by the textbook, you shouldn't get any of it. And then it becomes a, an uncomfortable space. I remember when WAL did that, you know, uh, flat wrist, close your hands, no pulling back, no covering your knuckle, or you get a foul. Holy shit. You should have seen that. It sounded like a fucking auction block selling fouls in the building. Uh, foul, 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 Everybody, the guys who didn't train right were so uncomfortable because now there wasn't any loading. There wasn't any like this fingers in the sky when your fingers are supposed to be pointing at your uh, opponent's face and you just close. You don't know how many people were like, oh, foul. It's like they physically could not do it. So do yourself the service of assuming you have the tightest waff ref and he doesn't even like you. He wants to follow your ass. And just get your bodies in lanes where it would be and put your hand flat and close it. And, you know, there might be some dink that's grabbing over your finger. And I got guys in practice that give me fits too. But when I look at it, like I'm giving away everything. So I figure if I put the brakes on that or go to war with that, I'm good with that because I'm good with being uncomfortable. If I go to a tournament and they take everything from me, well, I'm used to that at practice, you know? And it's not saying it's fair and you shouldn't be mindful of like fighting for a little more fairness, but at least you're not uncomfortable with yourself. Like I've had people that have grabbed me jacked up and I just know I just want to get my hand on the back of theirs and where I kind of want my shoulders to be and I'm good. So at least give yourself the advantage of you being okay and you not being the one that's got to cheat or get scrutinized and hope the ref doesn't see it because then you're dependent on all that stuff falling into line to win, you know, because when you train properly, you know, you won't have a problem crossing from wall to waff. Are there people that cheat in wall? Sure. Are there people that cheat in waff? I mean, I don't know how many tournaments Arson Lilly have won, and I don't think that guy ever pinned anybody without being this far off the back of the elbow pad, but I mean, that's... That's not to say that fouls and the refs don't miss things. I think you do yourself a service by training as if you got the strictest ref there. And again, by repetition, it creates habit and comfort in like a default setting. So just things like that to ponder. You know, think about who you're training with, how you're training, what you're doing before training. It all makes, it all ties together. So, you know, just food for thought from trainings and things I've seen people do. Now go implement it.